my guest for today is Chris Wooten. He's, well, you know, I'm going to let him say what he does and whatnot. And, you know, Chris, just tell us, what, what exactly do you do for a living? What's your, what's your deal? What's your... Well, I'm um, actually a paid podcast guest, <laughs> podcast guest and free. <laughs> no, <I'm... laughs> um, I do uh, fin- uh, comprehensive financial planning and wealth management. Uh, I own a firm up in the Conroe area. We're an independent registered investment advisor. So we do fee-based financial planning and investment work for clients. So <laughs> that's kind of a, a broad 50,000 foot. Yeah, yeah. Show. <laughs> yeah. Which, which is a, a nice way of saying, like you literally said there was like, this is what I have to say. This is the next thing I have to say. Okay, I'm done. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could tell you 20 minutes yeah, in yeah, detail what exactly. that entails, but it's, uh, <laughs> that would be quite boring. <laughs> well, I think it'd be boring to some people and interesting to others because <laughs> let's be honest in this day and age people are more at least more interested in reading about stuff that's happening in the world because honestly right. cryptocurrency has way too many people messing around with it and stocks i mean i've i've had people who i know know nothing about stocks or cryptocurrency start having conversations on social media about stocks and cryptocurrency and sure. i'm like when did you become this person? Because yeah. I remember this is the same dude who's like, hey, man, let's go down. And <laughs> I need to find my feet. They're missing. <laughs> your feet are right there, bud. No, that's not my feet. That's your feet. It's, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> it's an amazing time to be alive. It yeah. really is. Um, especially in the financial space uh, with the emergence of crypto over the last decade or so. Um, it, it really is interesting to watch. I mean, a lot of people are finding out like right now, uh, especially in the crypto space. Uh, I'll say this, the non-experienced folks are finding out, you know, yeah, you need to have a little knowledge in terms yeah. of, of knowing what you're doing. It's play, playing, <laughs> playing day trader is a dangerous game yeah. if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, well, that, that rule of thumb that I heard from the longest time was, uh, if you're going to play with something, and especially when the, the crypto stuff started, yeah. it was like, if you're going to play with it, know that you will lose all of that. Be okay with losing all of that. Right. Don't be upset. It, don't invest anything that you're not afraid of just disappearing and going bye-bye. Well, I, I read a, a story about a guy. He took <laughs> he took out a home equity loan against oh his God. house, over $100,000, I think it was. Oh. And he had it all invested in Luna and Terra. Oh. And uh, you know what happened with that here recently. And, and so uh, I think I think he said his investment right now was worth $400 or something like that. I mean, it was, oh. it was just crazy. And, you know, and he still has to pay off the debt. So, uh, but, you know, it's crypto. He could turn that 400 into 400 million, according to most of your day trading crypto guys. So, <laughs> Well, uh, it, uh, I would say that it's more, it's, it's closer to your luck yeah. because it is a good amount of luck because like, for instance, like you can schedule or plan or do whatever you want when it comes to like, especially crypto, you can schedule or plan whatever you want. But I mean, even if you are paying attention like a hawk, the minute you get distracted or something else, and even when you're on point, sometimes it'll just dip. And when it dips, it just keeps dipping and dipping. Yeah. And you're like, oh no, and you sell everything. And then it's like, oh, we're going to go back up now. It's yeah. like, you, you can't, you can't dictate how it's going to end. Yeah. You can only at best guess. Well, it's, I mean, there's tools you can use. I mean, there's tools you can use just like you can in the stock market. What's up, guys? 20% off entire store wide on apexenergydrink.com. Use the promo code MixItUp20 and you can get 20% off the entire store wide. Not just the energy drinks, we give you energy, stamina, focus, but. I'm talking about the t-shirts, the duffel bag, and some other stuff that they have on there, and they're always adding new clothing. So go check it out, apexenergydrink.com today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, to help control risk, but it's still a little more difficult because crypto trades 24-7. Yeah. Um, you know, most people that day trade are going to day trade uh, the day market cycle, you know, within its normal hours. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there are some aftermarket guys that do some things, but it's a lot more volatile. Mm. scary so most people don't dip their toe into those waters <laughs> yeah there's no joke about that it's volatile my goodness i mean i started seeing people when it started to get bad and people were having 200 million turn into 400 bucks or whatever mm-hmm. 
uh, I started seeing people go, uh, buy the dip. And I'm like, oh my goodness, please don't buy the dip. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends on the coin. I mean, let, let me say this. I'm not, I'm definitely not, you know, putting. Well, I meant Luna, yeah. don't buy the dip. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, well, I, I think, I think the stable coin aspect of that, uh, if you believe Doquan, the, the, the guy that wrote the algorithm, uh, that's probably going to go away forever. Yeah. He's, he's not going to try to make that come back. But there's a lot of people that were building on the platform that are, it looks like are staying with him. They're like, Hey, let's rebuild. You know, it's still a good concept. Uh, we're just going to have to figure out how to get around the stable coin aspect. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> but, um, but I'm not down <clears throat> on crypto yeah. uh, in a negative way at all. Um, I don't think it's going away. I think it's going to only get bigger. And I think what you're seeing right now um, is really just the real beginnings, if you will, Okay, so think of the internet back in the late 90s, Yeah, right? That's kind of where the space is, and I think what you're going to begin to see is some major consolidation, meaning yeah. a lot of your uh, crap coins, as they call them, um, <laughs> you know, like like the one that just collapsed. A yeah. lot of those over time, uh, you may see mergers, consolidations. You may see j- them just go out of business altogether. <laughs> uh, if, yeah. if they ever get a good regulatory environment in place for all of it, um, that could eliminate some stuff as well. So, yeah. you know, that all remains to be seen. L- let me say this before we jump off into financial yeah. stuff. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your podcast. This is, um, I've really been looking forward to it. Um, I've watched a couple you put out, um, yeah. the ones that actually have video. Um, <laughs> yeah. and so I, I know this one's not going to have video. And I was a little curious cause Joel said, well, I really don't want to put you on video. No, that's uh, not what it was. No. Okay. So he, he said, well, just look at you. Why would I want to put you on video? Okay. Every, everybody saw the, the 11 minute, uh, Sean Barnes, the first one I released and that, uh, literally my camera CMOS overheated and burned out. And I went, well, isn't this lovely? I went from having two cameras. Now I have one camera and that one camera is a phone <laughs> and it's not very useful or reliable. So you know, when the channel makes enough money, I'll buy two mirrorless cameras and then have the setup permanent. But until that time, plus, in all honesty, when I was looking at statistical values, podcasts do better than video. Yeah. Like the actual audio mm-hmm. on, because people will listen it throughout their day and their car, sure. whatever it may be. Yeah. So I was like, okay, let's let's do the full long episodes I, that way, little video clips to drag people to want to go see the full episode. I so. figured you would actually pull more viewership with me not being on video. Uh, so it probably, it's, it's better for you no matter how you look at it, man. It's better for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it really is fun. I, thank you for having me on. No, I, honestly, it, the whole idea of Work It Out was to have people on who, one, have a position or know something really well, who work really well, work hard, have good business ethics, you know, that sort of thing, and have them on to kind of discuss because let's be honest, I have never seen a video of someone talking about, you know, the position you do and things like that. Or, I mean, I've seen some vague things or some guy who pretends, hi, I'm Dirty Larry and I want to be your financial (laughs) planner. You know, like you see stuff like that, but it's like, I don't trust that dude. (laughs) So it's nice to discuss, you know, business, ethics, family, you know, life, that yeah. sort of thing with people who don't necessarily have had a platform as much you know, before. It, it's interesting. Um, years ago, um, earlier on in, in my career, the, the firm that I now own, I bought the firm five years ago, and mm-hmm. but have been with it for a little over 15 years. Yeah. And it's interesting because we used to do a radio show program here in Houston. Huh. Um, we did it for almost three years. Uh, we would go down, record live in the studio, and ultimately, I'm going to say a year and a half, two years in, we actually built out a recording space in our office, and we would just, you know, send the files, and they would cut mm. and all that. But anyways. <laughs> Very nice. Um, one of the reasons we got out of it uh, was because the time segment we were in, it was on uh, Saturday mornings, AM radio, right? Uh, it's nothing but financial programs. And our whole concept was built around uh, the, the foundation, I think, of mm-hmm. what any financial decision should be based in, which is financial planning, okay? Most, almost every single program around us was built around a product, selling some given product, life settlements, annuities, whatever the case was. And so what we found very quickly is that our message was just being drowned out 
uh, you know, cause we're, we're the opposite. We would be saying, don't buy these things <laughs> un- un- unless you have yeah. a financial plan <clears throat> that's driving the decision to do so. And even then you want to make sure that it's in your best interest, right? Yeah. That, that's in our industry. That's called a fiduciary standard. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah. So it's kind of cool to be back, back on the microphone. <laughs> I haven't done this in a while. Well, I, 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 I will say that, you know, the working out podcast part is, is a lot more fun cause it's more open, more sure. free. Cause with the other one, you know, you're reacting to like a music video or a song or a comedy performance and you have to be somewhat entertaining, you know, and make jokes and talk <laughs> mess and. Well, I'm going to do that anyway. Yeah. I can't, yeah. <laughs> so with, you know, the work it out podcast is like, you can delve deeper into like human behavior and mental health and yeah. life and love and, you know, mm-hmm. relationships and friendships, you know, that sort of thing, like more genuine conversation, yeah. you know, and that's what I like enjoying doing. Oh my goodness. I enjoy doing probably the reason why I was equally the guy who was the best friend of the gal, Mm -hmm. but also got the gal. That Mm -hmm. was the reason why is because I was like, I'm a real person. I'm not a weirdo. I'm not going to have some weird egotistical man. Cause my parents raised me right in that aspect. They were like, don't be a jerk to anyone. Just think about it. Would you like to have someone be a jerk to you? And I'm like, no, I hate it when they do that. (laughs) Well, and to your credit, you're a good listener, (laughs) right? Um, so that's why you had luck with the ladies. Cause you, you, uh, you listen, you, you actually listen. Yeah. You don't pretend like you're yeah. listening. No, I and, just, you know, I don't go, uh, huh. Uh, huh. I'm waiting for my next time to talk. No, no. <laughs> or, or as my wife likes to say, don't have selective hearing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So well, I do have that. That is, that is genetically bound by my mother and father. So I can't get away from that because I, I, I've had people, well, after having the accident in my head, cracking my coconut, my memory is not exactly the best. So, uh, I've had people be like, uh, this one woman came up to me like years later and she was like, you know, when we were, uh, 18 and I was like, yeah, I had a huge crush on you. I hit on you all the time. And I'm like, I did not know that. And she goes, <laughs> yeah, I noticed you had no clue half the time. I was like, was I flirting back? And you were like, yeah, but in a jokey way, <laughs> I was like, Oh, yeah, I do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I had no clue at all. I thought she was just messing with me. But most young men don't. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Women cr- progress so much faster than we do. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> they really do. I mean, look, look at it even today. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old, right? Yeah. Did I just say that? Can you cut that out? <laughs> I can <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost 50 years old and, and you know my wife's way smarter than I am. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm just a big child. I, <laughs> I mean, I do important stuff for a living and you know, that kind of stuff, but at heart, yeah. I, I'm not going to grow up, man. I still like to play around with my kids and yeah. joke and you know, I think, I think I, I think I'm the, definitely the same way. Like, yeah. cause I, I had a conversation, me and Sean Barnes were sitting here talking. The whole point was to talk about business and ethics and motivations, but mm-hmm. Halfway through the conversation, we end up talking about video games for like 25 <laughs> minutes because I didn't know he was into video games. Yeah. And then we started talking about it. I'm like, oh, you see Borderlands, Wonderlands? Well, I'm like, oh, my goodness. Because I remember what, okay, this is going to be crazy. My video game, like, uh, addiction, you could say, started with you. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. 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 Because you had the Atari. Uh-huh. And you had. Uh, you should oh. probably give some context as to how. Oh, yeah. Chris is my cousin. (laughs) I kind of totally forgot to talk about that. Anyways, yeah, Chris is my cousin. So, uh, wow, I can't believe I forgot to say that. Okay, uh, but you had an Atari, Uh and I think it was the den or your your, uh, dad's office. Yeah, yeah. And I played that thing every time we went to visit. The girls never got a chance. I'd kick them off. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I mean asteroids and oh was it centipede and oh what was the one where he jumps across the oh, pitfall uh, pitfall yeah. yeah yeah dude i played so frogger oh my goodness i played video games for a long time i i tried to keep up with it like when mm. my first child was born my son he's the oldest and he really loved playing video games i remember the first i don't know i guess the first game system we bought was the gamecube you remember the gamecube nintendo wow. gamecube yeah that takes me back a bit. <laughs> and uh, we, we got this game called um, Tom Clancy's uh, uh, Recon. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was the whole game, instead of like shoot 'em up games like you have now, the whole game was you sneaking around trying not to get identified. It's like, like espionage. You, yeah, you were like the stuff, spy, yeah. right? 
Um, Ghost Recon or what? But I no. just, yeah, I mean, they advanced. Yeah. I mean, another testament to technology. They just, they advanced so fast that, and I started obviously working a lot of hours and things like yeah. that. I just, I couldn't keep up. I mean, I he'd call me in there, especially the first PlayStation <laughs> we got. Hey, Dad, you want to play this shoot 'em up game with me? You know, we go mm-hmm. in there. Yeah, I was like, why even play? I mean, yeah. it's just he's killing me. You know, maybe it gave him confidence. I guess. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> beat my dad in video games. You suck, Dad. <laughs> well, well, I had the I had the father who was the atypical video games will rot your mind. Yeah, and then it wasn't really video games will rot your mind. It was more like I don't know how to play them, so I can't really do <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly, <laughs> because I know he didn't have yeah. any clue. Because he'd watch we. I remember they got us the first and only system they bought, which was like SNES and Super Mario World. Uh-huh. And they get they got that, and I think I got one other game, which was like F Zero or Metroid or Super Metroid or something like that. And I remember every time he saw me playing it, I could have just started playing it, and he reacted like I played it for seventeen <laughs> hours. And he was like, "Still on that video game system? <laughs> Why don't you go and mow the lawn, and take out the garbage?" I'm like, "I did that already. Why don't you go do it again?" Like, yeah. <laughs> we did have to put some controls on it. I mean, yeah. you know, if not, he'd sit there and play it all day. Because you can lose your life. Oh, just, sure. Yeah, yeah, disappear. On and some yeah. of these games have gotten so intuitive and so in depth that you're like, "It's been days." I thought it's been minutes. Like yeah. you just, you think you played for an hour and it's been seven. <laughs> Where's the day gone? Yeah. It was interesting. Like the first Nintendo system we got, you know, it had the little rectangle yeah. <laughs> <and> controllers. <laughs> and I'll never forget. I spent hours trying to beat Super Mario Brothers. Right. <laughs> and I beat it. I, I yeah. beat the game. And so I figured after I, after I beat it, I'd be like, oh, this is boring now. I beat it. You know? Yeah. It. No, then it was like, a com- how much faster can I beat it? Right? The efficiency so it, part. I was drawn in. You know, so the you, conspiracy theory. You were control. my type of player yeah. because that's the way I am. I'd be like, okay, well, like, because I the first time I played Fallout Three, that was such an immersive, amazing, apocalyptic game, and I was like, okay, I beat it in two hundred forty-seven hours because I got every little thing. Yeah, yeah. I was like. I wonder how quick I can do it now. And like the second time was 148. So I'd already cut like a hundred hours off. And the next time was like 65. And I was like, man, how quick am I getting at this? It was just because I made efficient routes to get every little detail. Yeah. Yeah. I do that like crazy. I don't care about shoot 'em up games anymore. Like mortal Kombat and all that. I can't play it. It's like, I, you, you have to have no brain to play this or really good hand skills. Yeah. And for me, it's more fun with strategy and, you know, I could barely walk and chew gum at the same time. I, the controllers <laughs> nowadays, there's like 48 buttons yeah. on them. And I'm like, was well, Dad, you have to put one. the uh, A sub button, B, you know, <laughs> sub level C button to make it do this move. And I'm like, all right, you know, just forget it. I'm out. Well, so. it went from Atari one button. And then it went from that to Nintendo, which was, I well, guess, technically, if you count start and yeah. select, it was two. And Super <laughs> NES was four. It was almost like it doubled every time yeah. a new system would come out. Oh, this is the new Xbox 27. It's got 67,000 buttons. I was more like the uh, Duck Hunt game button. Just one button yeah. with a pistol and pointer, and, you know, that was Duck about Hunt. It. Duck Hunt was I didn't fun. mean to go Sean uh, podcast on you and talk about video games. for No, 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 no. It's okay. Good. I actually <laughs> like a little bit of reality being splashed in. Okay, so I got some questions for you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me ask you this. When dealing with being in a high-pressure job, how do you find the time and how much importance like with family and friends is needed for your like good mental health? Um, I would probably turn the question backwards. Um, Mm -hmm. I would say that you need to build, I mean, I'm a little bit different, so I don't have, I mean, I worked in corporate America for many, many years. Um, I left corporate America to start my own insurance business. Mm -hmm. Um, Ultimately, that parlayed into the financial planning arena and then ultimately uh, working with the firm that I'm with now. So I had a background in uh, trading and risk management in uh, the oil and gas industry space. Um, but stocks and, and bonds and all that stuff, yeah. uh, although it's, there's still trading involved, um, it's different, right? It's You just have to kind of learn over time. But I would say that you kind of have to turn – that question around. I came from a corporate environment into what ultimately, you know, I grew up in an entrepreneurial home, yeah. right? So <clears throat> I worked for this firm for a long time and then ultimately wanted to buy it, take over, you know, and then run it, which I have done. Um, and those are, 
those are two very different worlds. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you're an owner uh, or self-employed, um, uh, there is a difference between those two, by yeah. the way. Um, <laughs> it, it's you, it, those things shift, right? And looking back on it now, if I had things to do over again, um, I, I have very little memory of my first two children's childhoods. Mm. Uh, my, my wife, you know, it, we, we talk about that all the time because I was gone when they woke up. Uh, they were in bed when I got home. I mean, mm. I was just working really ugly hours, right? And there came a point where I had to make a decision. Mm. Um, I'm either going to focus on my family or I'm going to focus on the career. Uh, and, you know, you, every, that's a choice everybody has to make, yeah. right? Um, in my world, family was the more important decision, yeah. okay? And even then, it's a lot of work, you know, to, to go do that. But all I'm really saying is, is if, if your family, you know, if you come to that point, you're making that decision and your family is the most important thing, I guarantee you when your kids are older, which mine are now, um, they're not going to remember what you worked 80 hours a week to buy them for Christmas when they were five years old. Yeah. What they're going to remember is the time you spent with them, the advice you gave them, those kind of things. Especially during the developmental years. Sure. You know, like when you're going through that preteen, teen, adult stage. Well, even even when they got into, I'll just say, you know, latter junior high years into high school, um, before that, I couldn't do things like attend their games. Yeah. Uh, both of my older two played sports. Madison's my artistic child. She's <laughs> more into choir and uh, <laughs> she's very artistic. She loves to draw. You know, she's yeah. a comic drawer, that kind of thing. Um, and so I didn't really have time to go put in and experience those things yeah. with them uh, when they were younger. So Madison's been a whole different ball game uh, because I was in a different phase of life. I've been able to, I mean, I drive her to school every morning and drop her off yeah. uh, on the way to the office, those kind of things. So we have time to talk and, you know, uh, how'd your day go? What's going on? You know, <laughs> rah, rah, rah. And, and most of the time as yeah. most, you know, 13 year old girls are they're you know, dead silence. It was fine. <laughs> Yes. Well, no. They, they're going to they're yeah. going to be that way till the end of time. It always feels like it. It's like, oh, yeah. well, it's better than screaming to the top of their lungs and being overtly dramatic, which also happens in the preteen years to teen yeah. years. Thankfully, we haven't <laughs> had too much of that. They've been pretty pretty well adjusted in that regard. But yeah, uh, back to your question. So I think everybody has to make the decision, mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to structure your life. You do the things, and you find the time for the things that matter the most. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so everybody talks about, well, I just don't have time for fill in the blank. Okay. No, you do have the time. We all yeah. have the same 24 hours in our day. <laughs> it's just a matter of priorities and discipline. Yeah. Right. So reorient your life, which <laughs> takes work and can have some pain involved with it, you know, depending on your situation, uh, reorient your life to what matters most to you and then structure your, your life, your job, everything around those things. That's one of the coolest things, I think, to come out of the whole COVID deal. Yeah. I mean, the whole work from home concept, <laughs> um, it's been proven you can do it and, and it can yeah. be done effectively. Now, I still prefer, I do a lot of online meetings with clients, yeah. but I still prefer to meet people in person. That's just my personality. I love that aspect of my job is really where my passion is, right? Yeah. You can train a monkey how to do finance. <laughs> Um, it, the, the relational part of it, I mean, there's guys out there that are dead level, uh, straight up top notch financial planners, but they have the personality of a turnip and they can't connect with people. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> a large part of what we do is managing emotion. Yeah. Okay. Um, helping people to stay on a disciplined path and managing the emotion of the things that happen along the way. Um, and a lot of guys just don't. They don't have that skill set. Yeah. So anyways, um, I think family should be first. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, that all you've said, it, it makes perfect sense because again, like I'm in an industry that can be a hundred percent out of your home if sure. you want to, mm -hmm. but it's funny because the bulk of my industry, when it comes to web designers and graphic designers, yeah, they don't have the people bug. Like mm -hmm. they're just horrible at it. Like, I can talk to a client, have a conversation, and they leave that conversation going, okay, I know this guy's going to take care of me. I know he's going to help me out with my graphics, my website, my videos. But 
when I talk to people about what they previously worked with, then it's a different story because they're like, yeah, he doesn't answer my calls very much. When I do get a hold of him on email, he's complaining about something he needs or he needs more money or this and that. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. And they're like, well, I don't trust if you can do that or not. And I'm like, yeah, listen to what I tell you. Yeah. Then in five days yeah, after dealing with me, you'll be like, oh, yeah, it's night and day. Yeah. So, I mean, we set standards like in our office. Yeah. I mean, we'll... Um, that I, I tell every new person that comes on board with our firm, um, and, and I have my advisors tell them the same, um, you know, when you call, when a client calls the office, um, email's a little bit different because you, you know, if you're like yeah. me, you, you get about 4,000 a day. <laughs> so when you call the office, especially if it's an important issue, our goal is to return the call immediately, but if not immediately within 24 hours. Okay. Um, customer service is, I think it's something that's kind of been lost to some degree within the technological uh, age that we're in. <clears throat> so um, people are still people, yeah. right? Technology makes life either uh, easier. It doesn't make people go away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're still here, right? Yeah, they still um, exist. <laughs> it's just we, we interact a little bit differently through different mediums, mm-hmm. right? Um, you mentioned high pressure. Um, to me structuring and reorienting your life around, uh, you know, balance with family, those kind of things. Um, it's the family, that interaction and focus there, that is part of what relaxes me after a high yeah. pressure day. I know that I get to go home, uh, decompress, decompress. My family's <laughs> there, uh, you know, those yeah. kind of things. Um, so it's helpful. You know, yeah. it seems kind of counterintuitive, but it's it's not. It all kind of works in place together. Well, I think it would only be counterintuitive if you were the guy that brought home work with you in every aspect. You're trying to listen to your kid, and you're thinking about all this other stuff you need to do. So decompression and disconnection yeah. is the thing you need to do when you get walking that well, door. You I know? mean, there's times where I have to work late, yeah. you know. Um, I And it used to be, especially in corporate America, <clears throat> um, I, I had a position at one point that, you were on call 24 hours a day. I've done all right? that. Oh. So um, I never felt like I was off the <clears> clock. <throat> yeah. Well, that's not healthy. <laughs> I'm not saying it can't be rewarding. It um, really is not healthy. And <laughs> you may even be able to make a lot of uh, money at it, but um, that will translate into your relationships. Yeah. That stress, um, that constant in the back of your mind, you know, having that there. And, you know, for me, again, it just, it had to be a choice. Um, so, you know, the stress aspect of it, there's ways to manage that, um, physical activity. I love going to the gym, love working out. Um, your diet has a lot to do with it, although that's an area I fail at because yeah, I love right. to eat. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so all that being said, yeah. you know, if you kind of reorient life towards the things that are the most important now, what if you're single? Right. Yeah. Well, if you're single, it's a little bit different. I mean, you have to evaluate kind of where you are in life um, with your priorities. And, you know, that could still boil down to a friend group. Yeah. Right. And uh, I don't bring work home anymore. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Which um, is good. Very good. I haven't brought work home. <laughs> I mean, there's times where I may have to put a fire out from time to time. Yeah. Um, but I look at it like this. Uh, when I leave the office at the end of every day, there is always, always without question, something I could be working on. Mm. It, it never goes away, especially yeah. as the owner. You, you're always faced with another decision, something else that needs to be done, uh, progressing in an area. Uh, I mean, you're familiar with marketing and what oh, we're yeah. doing there, right? Because you're helping <laughs> with some of that stuff. So, um, mm. but, but if I do that, I know where I go. Yeah. If I bring work home, I know what happens to the relationships at home. I know what that translates to. And so I make the decision not to do that. The work will be there. It'll get done when it'll it gets done. It'll always be there. <laughs> and, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I, I feel exactly the same way, which working out of my home becomes a little bit difficult yeah. and being single because it's like, you, well, but I have this weird disconnect. I leave that desk. I walk four feet <laughs> and I forget everything that's happening at that desk. Yeah. It happens every time. It's like a weird natural, like, yeah. like it's just a piece that rolls over. So I'll play a video game. I'll watch a TV show. Sure. I'll call mom, 
talk to her, or talk to some friends or whatever else, or go out and do something, you yeah. know, randomly to keep my sanity, I will disappear for three days and go to Dallas and go visit a museum, stay in a hotel or something like that. Right. I do randomly and I never tell anyone when I do yeah. it. Honestly, that'll probably be the death of me. Let's be honest. Is <laughs> when I die, my mom's going to get a message. Uh, do you know a man named Joel Hawkins? Yeah, that's my son. What happened? <laughs> um, did you know he liked to skydive without parachutes? Like, you know, something like In that. Singapore? Yeah. Where, what? <laughs> Base jump off of a building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing that. But if that's how I die, most likely something else yeah. went. But, yeah. You know, part of that, too, um, you know, <clears throat> you have employees. Yeah. Right? Let's, you think corporate America, or, you know, if you work for a business, whatever. Then you have self-employed people. Those are people that, like you, I mean, mm-hmm. you're self-employed. And then yeah. you have owners. An owner is somebody that has a business where he still may run some of the day-to-day stuff, but he can step away from his business for a month, and it's not going to miss a beat. Yeah. Okay? Uh, the majority of people are either in the employee <laughs> or the self-employed environment. Yeah. And it really kind of depends on where you are. I mean, like with me, if I'm wanting to scale the size of my firm, grow my business... <clears throat> the way that I try to maintain that that balance in life, if you will, um, has a lot to do with learning how to leverage your time, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the way I create more time and still grow with my family and then still grow my business is I can't be there doing everything. I've yeah. got to trust, uh, you know, giving tasks to others, hiring others to do things. Delegating. Uh, delegating, yeah. that's right. Okay. Well, uh, let me... I got another question. Uh, dealing with like other people's finances, do you find the world's view of you to be too cold and calculating to care? You know, because um, I've had some conversations with people over the years, and they're actually very daunted and frightened by the concept of it. Like, you know that that, and I'm sure you've heard someone say this before. It's like, you know, have you ever messed with cryptocurrency? Have you ever messed with stocks? I mean, they're like, oh, I don't mess with that. I'm, you know, I'm just, I, I, I don't, I don't really do that. And I'm like, so are you doing any investing? And they're just like, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not. I get, yeah. don't talk with your finances with just anybody, but come on, man, you can't be that scared of it. <laughs> yeah, It's well, not a I, troll under a bridge. I mean, if you think about it, I served on a school board uh, in New Kenny ISD where my older two kids graduated. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I realized is there's not, uh, in your younger years, high school especially, <laughs> there's very little financial education. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had one course that was kind of, you know, teach you how to balance your checkbook type thing, (laughs) which Um, I don't even think they do anything like that again, but, but it really, there really is a lack of, of education in that regard. That's why I'm big on education, uh, with our clients and so forth. But a lot of the people coming to us, I mean, we, we have a younger clientele, uh, more and more these days. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the people that tend to gravitate towards our firm or, you know, retirement planning, they're going to typically be, you know, 40 plus, right? Yeah. Um, my preference would be to have people in their 20s. I mean, we're, we're serving third generation clients. Um, and I love that because they're bringing in children, grandchildren to sit down and talk and just learn, yeah. right, about what's going on and how it works. And that's healthy. Um, and I, so I think the cold aspect, as, as you say, it has more to do with just a lack of knowledge, mm-hmm. a lack of education and a lack of knowledge, uh, creates fear. Uh, you yep. have fear of the unknown. That is okay? totally, totally true. Okay. So, so <laughs> if you educate yourself a little bit, um, you, you may still have some discomfort, but mm-hmm. you're not going to be completely blindsided if you go in and talk to to someone in a financial office. Yeah. The other thing is you really have to understand the type of financial office you're dealing with. There are different kinds and people don't realize that everybody yeah. calls themselves a financial planner or a financial advisor is probably the more popular term. <laughs> um, most financial advisors are not financial planners. They, yeah. they don't do true financial planning. Okay. Um, so understanding those differences um, is important. Matter of fact, uh, if you go to the Wooten financial uh, YouTube page, um, I've got a whole video series on there on how to recognize the difference in advisory offices. Um, no, also awesome. <laughs> now I think our industry has created its own monster in that regard. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause we're not an industry that's known for integrity because <laughs> you only hear, you only tend to hear about the stories about the, the bad guys that rip yeah. someone off, yeah. or, you know, whatever. And I, I genuinely don't think that that's the bulk of the industry, at least not guys, you know, at our level. And, and what we do. 
And so um, part of that is just, you know, uh, you've got to educate people into thinking differently about what they're doing, mm-hmm. you know, having a, uh, teaching them to have a more comfortable level of conversation when they come in. And a lot of that really depends on personality too. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a type A engineer come in, he's going to act <laughs> completely different in his line of questioning and so forth than, you know, the life of the party type person where they're no. just there to have yeah. fun. They hand you their bulk of paperwork and say, Hey, go get it done, you know, and, and let's go have lunch, that type of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it really depends. I don't think, I don't think generally speaking that people are cold. Um, they just have a little bit of fear of the unknown. And obviously, if they're coming into your office and they've never met you before and they know nothing about you, uh, meaning they read an ad and or saw it or, on our web page or whatever, and they're just coming in, uh, well, yeah, you're going to have a little bit of ice on the surface. That's kind of yeah. what we're trying to break through. You're you know? trying to find out, you know, exactly. Okay, we is this going to be a good vibe? Because that's that's an important thing. Because it is kind of a relationship. You yeah. know, it's not just a cold calculating business relationship you're trying to build something with someone that you're going to be spending a lot of time with this isn't you going and buying some type of product and that's the end of it you never see him again this is someone you're going to be working with you know so no question about that i mean uh, relationship aspect wise i mean i tell people when they first come on board as a client this is a two-way street this is not you come in uh, we develop a plan mm-hmm. and then it's set it and forget it. And I never see you again. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I, it's, it's important <clears throat> to set expectations mm-hmm. with people, proper expectations on the front end. All I ask you to do is come see me, call me uh, zoom meeting with me at least once a year. Yeah. Okay. I've got people that haven't been in, in five, six years. Mm. Okay. I, I can't twist their arm and force them to come in. Yeah. Um, I send notifications. We contact them every year. Hey, come in, see us. Let's get your plan updated, revised, take a look at where you are, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it is a two way street. It is genuinely a relationship. Yeah. And the people that stick around, uh, from a trust perspective, trust has to be developed. Well, the people that stick around with a given firm are going to be the people that are engaged right? Hmm. The average investor moves financial firms every five years. That's the statistic. Okay. Hmm. Well, if you think about it in a five-year period, you've not even gone through a full market cycle with that guy. Yeah. So you're evaluating someone without being able to see the full picture of their performance. Right. Uh, And whether that's me or, or the guy down the hall, Mm. Um, it may not be a fair comparison, right? Um, now there may be other reasons. I mean, nine ninety nine percent of the time, it's it has to do with a personality conflict. Yeah, they just don't connect, or they never hear from their guy. Uh, those kind of things, and therefore they want somebody that's engaged with them. So yeah. I think people, generally speaking, are looking for engagement. They want. Uh, somebody that's not going to be uh, cold in a relationship, right? <laughs> and believe yeah. it or not, that's hard to find. Uh, it's not the common path. So, well, I think one of the because a similar personality of the industry is is very similar to mine too. Because again, you have um, like that nomenclature is that people aren't people persons that are in the tech industry or this and that, like the SEO specialist and the SEO firms, SEO marketing, all of that. You wouldn't believe how many times I've had clients come to me and be like, uh, well, if I can be honest, I was with these people, but I didn't trust them because they weren't doing what they said they were going to do. And they were always delayed, uh, delayed or late, or they didn't do what they said they were going to do. And I found out from blah, 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 that they didn't do that. And I'm like, okay, well, how long were you with them? Oh, for like a month and a half. I'm like, that is not long enough to do anything of note. <laughs> I, and I tell them, I'm like, look, you are dealing when it comes to SEO. It's like trillions of websites that exist. And I had a client yesterday actually tell me, he goes, hey, man, uh, you know, I had a website built in 1999 that cost me $500. And that thing made me crazy money. And I'm like, that's great. That was 23 years ago. It has changed since then. 
Yeah. Would you like to know that the amount of websites back then were about a 16th of a 16th of a 16th now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that was like GeoCities pages. That was Google was not even a twinkle in an eye. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I, I laugh. I'm like, you're competing with so much more that's going on now. Yeah. So trying to act like being with a team or a firm or a, a marketing person or anything for more than a month and a half or a small cycle, it's not going to show you anything. Yeah. It's not going to do anything for you. So I, there are some red flags that people can look for. Uh, yeah. If if they go and, and sit down with somebody, mm -hmm. even if they click, let's say personality wise. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> If you go into a financial office and you're kicking the tires, so to speak, um, if they recommend a product to you in the very first meeting, I don't care, e even if they've looked over all your financial documents you've brought in, there is no way they can truly know whether or not a product recommendation is appropriate without doing what I would call a full-blown financial plan. Yeah, okay? due diligence. And that's why I think that choosing a fiduciary office, meaning fiduciary only, uh, again, see my YouTube page if you want to know what the differences <laughs> are, um, is so important uh, because, you know, if they're trying to recommend a product and they don't even really know what your true financial situation is and what that looks like and the implications of that 20 years from now, you, you've got a salesman. He's not a planner. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I tell people don't get sold, get a plan. That's, you know, it's like that with anything in life. No, right? it's true. If you're going to go buy a car, you don't just like, you know, cover your eyes and wander <laughs> onto the closest lot and put your finger on a vehicle and go, that's it. That's the one I'm buying. No, I mean, you, you plan, you look at the price, you choose the color you want, the options, what can I afford? Yeah. Um, and then even when you get to the dealership, I mean, if you're like me, if I get a guy that I don't like, the salesman, yeah. I'm finding another guy. Yeah. I'm not going to deal with that guy. No, no, that's right? true. <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that stuff bugs me too, because like, I've always done that. I've had friends and family or mostly friends that have been like, uh, yeah, you know, I got this for blah, blah, blah. I'm like, why, <laughs> what are you talking about? I got it for this much. And I saved this much. Did you not look at the paper? What are you talking about? It's 40% off down the road. And they were like, no. -uh. <laughs> and I'm like, all you had to do is open your eyes. It was right there in front of your face. Because what was funny is he was looking at the paper before he went and bought this uh, air fryer. And he was trying to find, he was because he was actually a, a chef. Yeah. He was like, I'm going to try out air frying on a bunch of recipes. And I'm like, okay. And he's looking at the paper. I see the ad on the front of it. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to go down there and just see what I can get up and blah, blah. And he goes down there and the guy, know I know that dude knew that that place was 40% off down the road. And he was like, Oh yeah, it's only 10% off here, you know? <laughs> and he buys it and he comes back here. He's like, I could have saved like a hundred bucks. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I'm an idiot. I'm like, yeah, you're an idiot. <laughs> Sidebar from the foodie. I, I love the air fryers. Yeah. They, uh, they actually, yeah, oh, that's my baby. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good stuff. If you haven't used one. You need to try it. It's really good. Uh, yeah, I will say that food that you have ate before mm -hmm. tastes different when you cook it that way. It does. It's just weird. Like even mini pizzas that I used to microwave from like 30 years ago, you know? Yeah. And I'd cooked it in there. I was like, this is a totally different meal. It yeah. tastes completely different. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, makes you feel like you're cheating in a way, like on your food, <laughs> like this tastes way better than it used to. <laughs> Something's wrong with that thing. Yeah. For the flavor inventor. Um, okay. So I've got a couple of other questions, but uh, the next one, I think, let's see. What's a, what's a, what's a interesting. How often in this day and age would you feel like we're distracted from pervert, like, from like preventing our own ruin, like we're distracting ourselves from actually doing something that can help us in the long run or financial planning, future investments, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Like how, how much do you think distraction is a part of just financial ruin or not financial ruin, just life ruin in general, you know? Okay. Um, I know you got something to say on yeah. this. <laughs> so, First of all, let's just use some common sense, yeah. right? We live in a culture that is defined by distraction. Yeah. Everything around us, uh, I mean, 
I mean, you're reading these questions from a list on your phone, right? Mm -hmm. Just just look at how people <laughs> are are buried in their phones. Yeah. Okay. And and I said this to my kids one time, and, and I used to say this at educational seminars that we used to do. Um, the world is swimming in a sea of information, yet drowning for knowledge. Yeah. I, no. And and I tell my kids. You literally have the world. I mean, when I wanted to know something when I was young, <laughs> I had to go to the library, use the Dewey Decimal <laughs> System index yeah. cards. Yes. I mean, it took an yes. hour just to find the book. Okay. Oh, so long. And and now you literally have the world at your fingertips. And so to an extent, it's made people lazy and apathetic. Okay. Mainly because now there's conflicting data, right? So you're, yeah. you're not sure, you know, if you pull up something, uh, information on a Roth IRA, right? Well, yeah. you'll have 4,000 people commenting on, you know, why a Roth is evil, why a Roth is good, uh, you know, what you what should be doing, why Roth. you shouldn't be doing, or whatever, <laughs> right? So And and so that creates a, a paralysis by analysis because you're not really sure what to believe, Yeah. okay? So we're in a world of distraction. and. Um, I do think in large measure that that harms people because they lose, you know, Americans are very short term in focus. Instant mm -hmm. gratification is the hallmark of our culture. Nobody yeah. wants to pay the price. And you can see that all the way up into our government. Okay. Um, the debt that we're carrying now, the decisions we've made in monetary easing and, and those types of things. Um, and yet they're trying to unwind it i.e. bring inflation down, those types yeah. of things, um, without causing, and you'll hear them say it in the media, too much pain. We want to bring it in with a soft landing, the Fed <laughs> says, okay? Look, that's part of the problem, Joel, yeah. is when you make a course correction after uh, screwing up for so long and making really poor financial decisions, the problem with most people is they want to get out of the pain immediately, and without without paying for it in with any that, way. yeah and i mean it takes going through some pain to unwind or undo um i guess bad decisions right so i think in i think in large yeah. i think in large measure people just have to you know kind of take a step back and go well you know whatever the situation may be let's say you're in a mountain of credit card debt and you know barely paying the bills and whatever you got to kind of stay take a step back and go What's the long term view here? If I yeah. don't if I don't make a, a correction course change, uh, where am I going to be in ten years? Where am I going to be in twenty years? I don't I don't want to retire or, or try to retire at some point and be in the same place I am today. <laughs> well, and I mean it's like that with anything in life. You just have to do an honest assessment and then be willing to bear the pain of what the course correction requires to get it fixed. Yeah. Okay. And the time to do that is not five years before you retire. <laughs> the, the time to do that is when you're young so you can learn the lessons, yeah. uh, create more value um, and efficiency in your life, um, and, and just generally speaking, make good financial decisions that don't throw you off course along the way. Um, if you're, let's say, a little bit older, mid to late 30s, those types of, of age ranges up to maybe 45, and you haven't started savings, uh, yeah, you're probably behind the curve, but that's not a reason not to start doing something. Okay. Yeah. Every little bit helps. And when we're staring issues with, you know, what most retirees nowadays depend on is social security. Well, when you're staring at issues of insolvency within that program and you have bills like a, a pretty decent bill this year that was shot down to fix the problem, yeah. um, Matter of fact, there's bills almost every year that get shot down to fix Social Security. Well, if they're not fixing the problem, then you have to ask yourself as a younger investor, um, am I really going to be able to depend on that? Yeah. And, and if I can't, then my uh, <laughs> the importance of my saving on my own, uh, keeping away from you know unnecessary debt, those kind of things, yeah. becomes even more important. Okay? Um, so... I, I used I, I tell a story, used to tell a story at the <laughs> educational events we did. There was this guy, and every day he would walk past this old farmer's house. And every day the old farmer would be out on his porch in his rocking chair, and he had this this old hound dog sitting on the, the porch next to him. 
And every day he'd walk by and that hound dog would just be, you know, howling every day. Like he was, you know, in pain. Yeah. And so after about a week, the guy stopped and he asked the old farmer, he's like, Hey, um, why's your hound dog always yelling? And the old farmer looks at him and he goes, yeah, he's laying on a nail. And he's like, well, why doesn't he just get up? And he said, well, I guess it doesn't hurt bad enough yet. Oh. And the moral to the story is right. Most people choose to stay distracted because their pain threshold hasn't been met yet. Yeah. And it's only when the pain of where you are becomes uh, more important than the pain of getting out of it. Right. That you make the choice to do something different. It's just a choice. Yeah. Um, but it takes for, for many people, a lot of pain to get them to the point where we're, they're willing to sacrifice what's required to do it. So, well, I can, I can honestly say that. Yeah. I've, I, well, I avoided life for just so you guys have some background. I avoided life for about I don't know, 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I went from being a kid who was 18 and went to college for a year because my parents made me. And, uh, then I came home and I was like, I don't want to do this. So I just disappeared and I toured and played music and just had, and everybody thinks that because that happened, they're like, Oh, so you were like doing a bunch of drugs and getting drunk all the time. Blah, blah. I'm like, no, I didn't have the time for that. When you're a musician and you're poor and you're eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to try and survive, <laughs> uh, you really don't have the money to be buying drugs. Like the only people who get drugs are people who are well, better singers, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, I lived my life as kind of a nomad and I did it for a long time. And my, my initial plan was no plan. I didn't want to, it was almost like lost boys, Peter Pan crap. Yeah. I didn't want to grow up. I just wanted to be me. And I always saw my friends who were like 24 and just out of college and immediately going to be married and having a kid. And I'm like, oh, I don't want that. And I had friends who were in high school who had kids. And like their kids are now grown up, gone. They're in college, and their parents are having a great time now. They're actually way better off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, when I looked, it was just like, man, I just want to live for me for now. Because the one thing I did see was I saw my friends who would end up having kids, and they were still living for themselves, and they were ignoring those kids, or they were treating them like trash. And I was like. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be obsessed with alcohol and this and that, but I also don't want to be the guy who's secretly wants to be single and live my life. If I have a child and a wife, you right, know, right. I want to have that run out of me, like running a dog out of its energy every day. So it'll nap on the porch with you yeah. and lay on that nail. <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's, that's what I wanted. And when it was around 32 or 33, I was like, I need to start investing and doing things because you can't be like living paycheck to paycheck. You have $20 in your bank when you pay all your bills. That's sad. Like, yeah. and I didn't own that much either. I had a bed, a bed frame, a nightstand, and yeah. like a desk and a computer. Yep. And that's like, and a small couch. That's what I owned and some dishes. That's embarrassing. Well, <laughs> well you have to, you know, you've, there's a book that came out years ago, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, and one of those habits is you begin with the end in mind. Okay. Well, if you haven't thought about that, yeah. so any, any and endeavor you take, <laughs> you have to think about where do I, where am I going? What, what do I want to come out of this? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you think about it, I, I have a phrase I use with clients. I say, look, if you, if you don't know where you're going, you're already there. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that's a good one. You, I like you, that. <laughs> you need to plan and then you make course adjustments uh, along the way. And here's, here's the beautiful thing about life and about people. We're all different mm -hmm. and we're all unique, right? So no two people that come into my office are going to be identical, yeah. right? There may be commonalities here and there um, as to things you need to do to make course corrections. And, and, but my point is that you can start anywhere at any age. Is it better if you start young? Yes. Uh, but if you're not, that's okay. Uh, it's just the first step. You, you got to take the first step, right. To start the journey. So, uh, get a plan, think about where you want to go, mm -hmm. define that and then adjust that. And, and, you know, cause I guarantee you most people, by the time they hit their fifties, yeah. okay, they're going to be in their peak earning years. Right. So 
life isn't over. Uh, for most people in their late 20s, especially into their 30s, it's, it's really just getting started from, uh, I'll call it a revenue perspective, yeah. right? You may be frustrated now, but as you progress in your career, you gain more knowledge as your business grows, as you move up the corporate ladder, whatever your situation is, your income is likely to increase. The question is, is what are you doing from a plan perspective to optimize that and make it work for you in the best way possible. I'll give you an example. Um, the studies that have been done in the 401k market, okay, so people that work for companies that offer a 401k retirement plan, 401ks are all different. Yeah. Um, they offer different investment options. The cost within them are different. Uh, does the employer contribute? Do they not uh, to what you contribute, uh, meaning matching? Yeah. Those types of things. Um, it's close to 80% or better of nationwide 401k participants have never made an adjustment to their 401k holdings within the last year. Okay. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> and, and the reason why is most of these plans are not allowed to give investment advice. Yeah. Uh, they can tell you if, if a fund in their plan is considered, you know, high risk or not, but they won't tell you put 20% of your money here, 10% of your money there. Uh, and then the next quarter, we're going to review that again and we'll make adjustments as needed. Yeah. Okay. Nobody's given them that. So if you're a person that has that type of an opportunity, you could really be wasting a lot of time and a lot of your money, uh, especially free money you're getting in, in matches from your employer mm -hmm. uh, by not just managing what for most people outside of a, of a home, if they have one, uh, that they are buying, um, outside of a home, the 401k is typically the largest asset most people own when they retire. Mm. Okay. So optimizing those types of things is important and, um, making sure that you're being efficient with them and, and, and making the right decisions with them. Am I contributing enough? Am I contributing in some cases too much? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, those are great things that you can start very young as you enter the workforce, um, if you're self-employed like yourself, yeah. um, it's a little bit different. You have to use different vehicles uh, mm -hmm. to be able to save, right? Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, throwing a paycheck at crypto. Although yeah. I know people who have made a ton of money uh, trading crypto, right? Um, but again, that's a whole different conversation. No, it, it definitely is a whole different conversation. Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of glad that we're having this discussion because I think it's going to help people that listen. They're going to hear just reality. I think a lot of the times it's you, you're right. It's that salesman attitude you have in a lot of ways when it comes to the financial industry. Like I can't count how many times I've seen people be like, you know, doing interviews and this and that, and they talk about crypto or a certain stock, or they talk about, a. uh, uh, Oh, what was that one guy who just literally talks about the same stuff that your mom and dad used to talk about, you know, interest bearing CDs and things like mm -hmm. that. So it was, it was, a, uh, and it's just always a product that they're trying to sell or move a book, an audio file, something that they're trying to move yeah. that oh, it's the secrets to investment, proper planning and this, and that. And I'm like, dude, you seem like a snake, snake oil salesman. Like yeah. you, that's exactly what you seem like because you're not, you're not giving me, like I'm not giving you information that you can actually use to cultivate something mm -hmm. that is tailor made for you. A lot of generalities when it comes to those things, it just weirds me out. Cause it's like, I know it has to be bespoke. It has to be, it should be. You can't just generalize investment planning and be like, everybody invest 20% in here. Everybody yeah. invest $15,000 in here. It's a guarantee that that's going to work for every single person. Yeah. Well, you, you'll see financial ads, um, for example, anytime you hear the buzzwords in a financial ad, mm. uh, guaranteed, uh, yeah. no, no market risk, that type of thing. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, they're talking about annuities. And, and here's the thing. Um, I, I have a phrase I use and I, the phrase goes something like this. I, I don't believe per se, ex except for maybe variable annuities. I'll throw that in there. Yeah. Uh, cause I've just, <laughs> I've, I've evaluated them for, you know, almost 20 years now and there's just better ways to go tackle uh, the problem that most people are trying to solve through those. Yeah. Okay. The fees are pretty high inside of them. Uh, you still bear all the investment risk. 
Um, and most people don't know how to manage their investment risk and they don't have anybody doing it for them in a decent way, typically. So, uh, that set aside variable annuities, um, I don't believe that there are necessarily bad financial products. What I do believe is that there are bad application of financial products, Mm -hmm. meaning uh, people get sold things or talked into utilizing things that quite frankly are just not in their best interest. It's Mm -hmm. not what fits the need of their plan long-term. Anything can go sideways. That's just the nature of risk in general. But Part of financial planning and its discipline is taking, you know, primarily five different areas, taxes, insurance, investments, estate planning, uh, so forth, mm-hmm. and then coordinating those in an ongoing way so that it creates essentially a best interest outcome for you, the client, not the firm, yeah. right? So when you hear guys and they're talking and using these bu- buzzwords either for a product or to sell a book or something um, have you ever heard the analogy if, if, uh, the only tool you have is a hammer, everything tends to be a nail. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's that mentality. If, if I'm a life insurance salesman and I wrote a book on, uh, how to create the most efficient tax-free income, <laughs> right? Uh, you use the methods that the billionaire families in America use yeah. to create tax-free wealth for their heirs. That's life insurance. That's what they're talking about. So I'm going to help you cut through all the crap. Those of you that are listening, <laughs> you, you can listen for key buzzwords in these ads and I can tell you exactly what product they're pushing. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong with the product. The question is, is, is it appropriate for you and what you're doing? Yeah. Using life insurance as a strategy to create tax-free retirement income is a valid and very good strategy. Um, but it's not for everybody. Yeah. Okay. You typically have to have a lot of wealth, right? Um, if, if you want to do it the right way, you have to be a little yeah. bit wealthier. Um, and that's, again, a whole different conversation. <laughs> my, my, my point is, you know, don't get talked into things um, by, I'll call it the current marketing gimmick of the day is what they call authoritative marketing. You've heard that? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> everybody wants to be viewed as the authority in their field. And so therefore oh, yeah. they'll, you know, tell you they wrote a book. Um, yeah. Most of them have probably been ghost written, but anyways, uh, you know, they wrote a book or uh, they've got a radio show they've had for a number of years. Well, I had a radio show, right? And I'm not saying authority is bad, but you just need to be careful that the authority marketing they're doing isn't to push a particular product if they're genuinely trying to educate you, right, um, and they're genuinely doing planning to figure out if whatever they're educating you on is in your best interest, that's the key, right? Um, if it's just somebody pushing a particular product line because it pays them more, yeah. um, to me, that is not a best interest standard. No, that, that's that's completely self-motivated. <laughs> sure. sure. Well, uh well, let me ask you this. Do you think people are slightly changing topics? Because let's be honest, a lot of those guys you see on television who are trying to sell this and sell that, you know, they kind of have that an airing personality where it's like, I'm a billionaire, so I know what I'm talking about, you know. Which, by the way, I would love to see all of those guys proof because I promise you they're n- that's billionaire is hard to really swallow on most of that. But uh, do you think people are too obsessed with, like, rich, lazy schemes, reality TV stars, musicians, famous actors. I mean, like the whole, the, the ethos of fame, fortune, quick and easy. Like, do you still think that's people's okay. mindset? Well, like it was in the eighties, especially. <laughs> well, I, I don't, I don't think that that has a, an age limit on it. Yeah. Me- meaning, you know, which decade we're in, uh, people by their very nature, um, for the most part, want the easiest path to the largest payout. Yeah. That's just human nature, right? If I can, if I can get a larger payout by playing the lottery, right? Easiest path, (laughs) smallest spend. And, and, you know, I've got better odds of being hit seven times by lightning than winning it. Yeah. But Hey, if I hit that payout, you know, uh, whatever. Right. I mean, it goes back really Joel to the question of pain. Yeah. That people don't, they're not willing to go through the pain and discomfort of doing something in a methodical way. Um, and look, I, you know, 
I know a lot of day trade guys and they make a lot of money, but they're guys that treat their day trading as a job. Yeah. Now, if that's you, meaning you're not Joe Blow day trader that, you know, uh, you're at your computer for two hours a day and that's all you look at it. No, these guys are, they're doing analysis. They're digging in. They treat it genuinely like a job. Okay. And I also don't think people realize that it, it, it genuinely is easier to make money when you have money. It's me. It's easier yeah. for us, for example, to manage a client with $5 million than it is a client with $5,000 from an investment perspective. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I don't look at either client any differently. Um, I don't think that's right. That's just my upbringing. Okay. So I'm not, I don't have account minimums at our firm, that sort of thing. I'm going to treat the guy that's just getting started no different than I treat, you know, uh, a wealthy client that comes in that's already worked most of his life to create the wealth that he has. I think they both earn, uh, or excuse me, both deserve respect. Um, they deserve professionalism and they deserve good, solid financial planning that, that has no, shouldn't have any wealth barrier yeah. right, or age barrier. Yeah. It should just be something that is in our industry. Yeah. But the fact is it's, it's easier and more cost effective. Yeah. to manage really large clients than it is really small clients. Okay. Um, but back to the question, it's really about the pain. Um, yeah. uh, I don't, I know a real, I, I know a lot of really hardworking people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I don't think it for, for many people, I don't think it's laziness or a lack of work ethic. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how to get started because they may feel like they're barely paying the bills every yeah. month, right? Well, in reality, when I dig into someone's budget with them, we can almost always find areas uh, to help them get started. The problem is, is it creates pain yeah. to do that. And they're not willing to go through the pain. They don't, yeah. they don't want, they, they want the instant gratification, right? I don't want to do without cable. I don't want to do without, uh, you know, maybe a, a $50 phone bill instead of a $200 phone bill, those kind of things. Right. And so because they're not willing to take these short term discomforts, um, they're probably always going to have discomfort. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, cause I had, you know, multiple friends who again were in college and I was doing my whole I don't, I don't know what to call it, like nomadic tribesmen or something, but <laughs> like, cause I literally in 10 years lived 36 different places. Good grief. Yeah. So I moved quite a bit <laughs> and sometimes would be middle of the night, just, well, I mean, I, I got nowhere else to go <laughs> and just pack it up in the car and let's roll. Drive but, till uh, the, drive till the car runs out of gas. Yeah. And that's I, where I'm staying. I've done that twice, but, uh, <laughs> uh, Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of how I live my life. So I'd have people who were, you know, investing and doing this and doing that. And I don't think for the most part, they were just get rich quick schemes or not like that. Those people are a certain type of person. Like they listen to the guy with the questions on the jacket and whatnot, but, uh, no, it was more like efficiency. Like they were trying to be as efficient as they could. They wanted to get where their parents got quicker. Yeah. Like that was their idea. Sure. And of course, everybody else was like, why don't you come out and drink with us? No, I'm going to work and put this towards building my future. Most of those friends I had that were like that, yeah, they're multimillionaires now. And they work not as hard as they used to. But what I always liked was because no matter what, I've always had a work ethic because I enjoy working. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even when I had to work construction and odd jobs, I actually really enjoyed working construction, doing like drywall and not roofing as much <laughs> <laughs> or attic work. Yeah. Not, not or, in Texas anyway. or, or AC work. I did not enjoy yeah. any of that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> cause you can get a breeze while you're painting in a house exactly. with no windows, but, uh, uh, yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, these, these guys ended up becoming multimillionaire guys and women that ended up becoming multimillionaires because they were efficient in the way, not just how they invested or how they, they worked, but it was, Every bit of money they made, they pay their ba- bare minimum of where they lived and their bills and things like that. But the rest of that money went towards not just investments, but buying equipment to expand and diversify That's business right. and yep. to grow their business. And then it was to open up new avenues or 
invest in maybe something a friend is doing and he has the same work ethic you do. Let's see yep. how that goes. So it was always constantly moving the bar, being poor, forced to being yourself poor, but moving the bar consistently until it got to the point where that bar was already pretty high and he was doing things that most people dreamt about doing. Well, think of like uh, the tiny house movement. Yeah. You've heard of that, right? Um, a lot of that is driven by, you know, people that are willing to not, let's say, fall into the trap of our parents. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I probably put myself in this category. You know, United States culture is home ownership, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that per se. Um, but it does. It's, it's a drain on your pocketbook. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would encourage people to read. There's a book. Uh, written by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He's actually got a series of those books. They're all very good books, very foundational on really how to identify what is an asset versus a liability. Yeah. Uh, why is cash flow more important than other things, right? Yeah. Um, because that was the first time, and I was out of college. I was working in a financially related job, and it was the very first time when I read that book that anyone had ever described a home as a liability rather than an asset. Yeah. Okay. Because you're always taught, well, I've got all this equity in my house and whatever. No. An asset is something that puts money into your pocket. A liability is something that takes money out. And for most Americans, home ownership is a liability until they sell it. Yeah. When they sell it, it may be, it may be an asset or it may not. Of course, right now the market's hot and there's probably a lot of uh, people that would define that as an asset at this point. Um, but yeah, it's ridiculous, you know, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, I, so I work in the world of investment products, stocks, bonds, mm-hmm. uh, you know, insurance company, uh, products, those types of things. Um, but that's not the only place to invest. I mean, yeah. my dad, you, you know, um, had a construction business. That's what I grew up in entrepreneurial home. And the way that he increased his revenue was he went out and got <laughs> more work, yeah. uh, bought, bought, meaning invested money into more equipment. Uh, to do more work and grew it and grew it and grew it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, depending on what your asset is, er- everyone's path to an, I'll call it retirement in terms of investing may look different. Yeah. Um, for a lot of people, their retirement asset is their business. They're trying to build a business entity that they can at some point sell um, in some way, shape or form. And that, yeah. that is their retirement um, for others. It's not. So, yeah, well, it's, it's again with, with, uh, kind of the whole aspect of how I lived was when I decided (laughs) I'm actually going to start doing something and Mm -hmm. because it it was a very huge adjustment to go from living with my parents to just being a crumb bum for like a decade (laughs) and a half. And honestly, don't get me wrong. It was a very useful skill set. Because I've noticed is that when I have, like, for instance, Harvey, when uh, the freeze happened, when COVID happened, like, there were a lot of people I knew who were like, I need help from somebody. Somebody give me help. And I'm like, oh, I've lived in a garbage dump practically, so I'm I'm, I'm going to be okay. Like, I didn't worry as much about it, even though I should have worried a little bit more. But, uh, <laughs> like, for me, it was just... It wasn't, okay, I failed or something failed. It was, what do I do to fix it? What do I do next? What's the first step? What's the baby step that goes into it? So, like, my question is that when someone's thinking about trying to get into that world, what's that first baby step? Like, what do you think they should do? Like, assess, of course, but after assessing, like, they conversate with certain things or certain people or well, I, I think to some degree doing a little homework, yeah. right? Um, educating yourself, depending on, depending on if you're talking about getting into the investment game, if you will, yeah. uh, beginning to put money towards that. Um, I have some pretty, uh, I mean, with the amount of experience I have in the industry, I have some pretty hard line opinions on that. Mm-hmm. Meaning uh, for most people, the reason they're in trouble is because they've never been taught how to delay their gratification. Okay. And, and we've talked about that, so I, yeah. won't, I won't beat that dead horse. Um, <laughs> but that is important 
because in doing that, that allows you the first step. And to me, the first step is you need to get three to six months worth of expenses saved and put aside in cash. Don't even worry about how much interest you're earning on it at, at that point. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's liquidity. And what that does is when you have less cash flow and you're either in a hole or on the verge of one, um, you don't want to be in a situation where, well, my car broke down and now I got to go put my $2,000 repair on a 25% interest credit card. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it builds some liquidity aside that is an emergency fund is what we would call it. All right. Now it could be more, uh, if you're more comfortable having six to 12 months, six to nine months, that's all a matter of what your comfort level is. The, The goal of that is if I lose my job, or if I have work that doesn't come in after a storm, you've, you've told that story, right? Yeah. Uh, about yourself. Um, how do I pay the bills? Yeah. Okay. That's an emergency fund. And it also, when you get to a point where you've got that put aside, then over and above that, you begin putting money towards investment. Okay. Uh, the reason that's important is because when you get into a situation where you might have to dip into the emergency funds, um, you're not having to go pull money out of your retirement accounts and pay penalties on them yeah. to get access to it. Okay. So there's multiple reasons, you know, to do it in that format, to do it the right way. Yeah. But there are some people out there that, you know, they're just, they have a bigger appetite for risk. And so, you know, enter the guy I talked about earlier that took <laughs> out a home equity <laughs> loan and invested in crypto. Well, yeah. I, and, and look, I'm not, I'm not yeah. downing that at all. Um, no. Uh, there are stable coins within the crypto environment that you can earn, you know, eight to 10% APY uh, by letting uh, their platform stake uh, by, you know, staking on their platform. Um, If you're a big enough risk taker and you understand what staking means, okay, it's not like a bank paying you eight to 10%. (laughs) If you understand what that means, uh, you could get really creative. I could go take out a line of credit at, you know, 4%, stake it on a platform earning 10% and I'm making money. I have enough money to pay the loan. Yeah. Right. And I'm still making 6% of my money. Well, most people aren't willing to take that kind of risk. Yeah. Okay. So what I would say is if you're dipping into an environment that is high risk, it's not well established yet, like crypto or whatever, you need to educate yourself first and foremost. And sometimes education means paying for education. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, just try to get some decent people that are <laughs> reputable. Okay. Um, I don't fault them for making money yeah. with education programs. You just got to make sure that the education you're getting is legitimate and it's good, meaning you can actually utilize it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but educate yourself first and foremost, and then dip your toe in the water. Don't invest more than you're willing or able to lose. To lose yeah. Right. Um, anyways, first step is just take the first step, Joel. I mean, uh, you know, you're asking me how to get started. Uh, What should someone do? Well, that may not necessitate sitting down with a guy like me as the first step. Yeah. Um, It may be as simple as, oh, here's a concept. Know what you spend every month. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, hey. You know what? I know people that have no clue. No, 85% of the people that come into my office have. If I ask someone the question, if we're going through a data gathering session, okay, and I ask somebody the question, so tell me how much you spend every month. And and they answer with an answer like this. Oh, it's probably somewhere around, they have no idea. Yeah. Okay. You either have a number or you don't have a number. And if you're guesstimating, chances are you don't budget. You don't really have a clue what yeah. you're really spending. Also, we're in the age where people use a lot of reward credit cards, those types of things. And what ends up happening is... Um, they'll carry credit card balances to get rewards. They're not meaning they're not paying them off every month yeah. and they've got money they spend out here out of their bank account and they forget about what they're spending on the credit card and it doesn't go into their total expenditures. Right? So my, my point is you've got to know where you're starting from to then develop a plan to get where you want to go. Yeah. And it could be as simple as that. I mean, just know, know where you are do a little bit of due diligence and uh, investigative work in that regard. I mean, I've told people 
uh, an old school method, carry around a little, you remember the little spiral, uh, oh, yeah. the little notebook things that yeah. you could fit in your shirt pocket, you know? Okay. Yeah. Cops still use those. Yeah. <laughs> hey, take a, take a pen, pencil, carry that with you for yeah. 30 days. And I mean, literally document every cent that you spend and you'll get a real good handle in short order on whether, you know, yeah, there exactly. are, How there are almost <laughs> always areas you can cut. Okay. Yeah, there is. I mean, if you're like me and you can spend 50 bucks at Taco Bell, um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's always areas. <laughs> My wife uh, used to make fun of me when we were dating. She's like, you're the only guy I know that can spend $25 on the Taco Bell dollar menu. It's like, <laughs> honestly, that that's, that's a heavy meal. That's a heavy meal. That and Italian food. Oh, man. By the time you're done, you're like, I don't want to move. I'll just roll me to the bed. Cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, um, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of people have issue not knowing that starting point. And um, because they, it, to them, it's daunting. So yeah, they're it's like, intimidating. Sure. They don't really, they think, honestly, I think it's a little bit of self, it feels like more like self-loathing. Like mm-hmm. they don't. I'm too stupid to understand this is what, but you're no. not, you're not too dumb to understand it. Mm-mm. And the only way that can actually be true is if you make it true for yourself. If you allow yourself to just down your complete existence and act like you're too dumb to understand how dollars and cents work, you, yeah. you have basic math skills. You can understand <laughs> how expenditures work. So investing in your future just don't listen to anyone who does sound like snake oil salesman you know do your research talk to people talk to your parents even maybe if your parents are very successful and they they didn't just get lucky (laughs) but they're very successful have a conversation with them uh your uncles or whatever else don't talk to your i don't know your cousin who lives in a Trailer park. I don't. I don't know. You could call. <laughs> you could talk to your cousin. He's probably going to tell you another way to invest. And let's just hope it doesn't involve bathtubs and meth. But <laughs> well, look, I, I grew up in a trailer park and I turned out just fine. So, no, 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 you know. I mean, it's. Uh, Wait, you I mean, did really? Yeah, we lived in a trailer park for years. Huh. Yeah. I don't remember I'm sure that. You did. Well, you remember Papa had a trailer park. Oh yeah. Yeah, we lived. Dude, lived I love that years. place. Yeah. I love that place yeah. so much. Don't well, look, I, yeah. you know, I would just echo what you just said. The, yeah. the, the key is to just get started and the way, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah. One bite at a time, right? <laughs> I mean, just, just get started, phrase. just get started and take little baby steps yeah. uh, that allow you to wade into the waters at a comfort level, if you will. Meaning if you try to just immerse yourself into every aspect of your financial future all at one time, it is very intimidating. It is very daunting. And And you could burn out. And yeah. And I mean, you just get frustrated and throw up your hands. So just take it a step at a time. Um, I I don't, I don't mind having conversations with people. We don't charge anything for someone to call the office. Um, If you just reference this podcast, for example, say, Hey, I heard you on Joel's podcast. Um, go to wootenfinancial.com. It's W O O T T O N financial.com, just so you know how to spell it. Uh, but if you go to wootenfinancial.com, just call, schedule a phone call. Um, tell me that you heard about me on Joel's podcast or whatever. And, and I don't mind having a conversation with people at all. Yeah. That is part of what breaks down, I guess, the fear barriers and begins the process of just beginning, starting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if you don't do that, well, you're, it's not going to change, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, babe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on, Chris, and had a lot of fun. Good conversation. Probably have you on again later. Sure. You know, maybe bring H or somebody else in for the, once we actually get some funds coming in here, we'll bring in some more microphones and have some more in-depth conversations. But, uh. Again, like you said, go to Wooten Financial. W- Wait, am I dropping out? Did it sound like bit. I was dropping out? Yeah, I've been w- dropping out too, though. O-O-T-T-O-N, financial.com. If you don't know how to spell financial, it's worth a Google. <laughs> but, um, yeah, go there. And uh, I totally forgot to play our sponsor's commercial Uh-oh. this entire time. Today's program has been brought to you by... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to do it at the end here. So we'll just be quiet there. I said it. 
Do you have weak hands, bones of a bird, or eyes of a blind raccoon? <laughs> well, we can't help you there. But if you have low energy, it's a long focus commercial. and stamina, then say no more. ApexEnergyDrink.com is built for you. It's so dumb. Listen, if you're tired of being owned <laughs> by 10-year-olds from South Korea at Warzone or PUBG, then ApexEnergyDrink.com might be a godsend. Caffeine, Alpha GPC, and a smattering of other vitamins give you the energy, stamina, and focus needed to be at the top of your game. And let's be honest, if you're drinking Monster Energy Drink, it's probably making you sick or having nuclear pee. And if you're drinking other alternative energy drinks, then you're probably dealing with that whole blue raspberry with a side of feet fungus. That's a great aftertaste, I tell you. But if you want something a little bit different, try Bomb Pop, Cherry Limeade, Blue Raspberry, and Citrus Blast for ApexEnergyDrink.com. I promise you, taste amazing. So get back to gaming or riding motocross or work in construction. Whatever you do, if you need energy and you need to maintain focus and stamina, then definitely choose ApexEnergyDrink.com.